Want to go far in business and in life? You can't do it alone. The secret is expanding your network of personal relationships, building friendships, connecting on an intimate level, away from the office, over a coffee or cocktail. Welcome to All In with the real Nate Payo. The show that asks what happens when you go all in and leverage the power of your network of personal relationships. From author Donnie Bovine comes the book, How to Be a Success Champion, available on Amazon. After years of living other people's dreams, author Donnie Bovine decided to jump out on his own and start a business thinking it would be easy. Instead, he had a rude awakening and quickly understood that he had spent 20 years being an employee and had no idea how to be a business owner. His business was tanking and he was on the brink of losing everything when he decided to fight for business freedom. In this must-read and life-changing book, author Donnie Donnie Bovine shares with readers his story intermingled with lessons learned from his mistakes and his failures. In How to Be a Success Champion, you will find advice the author received from mentors and how he went from zero to a six-figure business. The author walks you through the steps of how to get out of your own way, how to play the game of business and win, find your strengths, how to network effectively, how to build a personal brand, how to create champions for your business, how to get great at sales, how to take complete ownership of your you and your business how to be a success champion from author donnie bovine available on amazon in both kindle and paperback editions order your copy right now it makes a great book for corporate events too how to be a success champion from author donnie bovine available on amazon hello hello and welcome to the all in podcast with nate pale of course i am your host nate pale today is a very special guest jackie hermes Jackie has been the CEO of Acelity, a Milwaukee-based agency that helps software-as-a-service startups get revenue and grow faster. And she's also a co-founder of Women's Entrepreneurship Week. She's very active on LinkedIn and has over 50,000 followers. She publishes content daily about the life and challenges of growing her company. She's also an advisor to early-stage startups as a mentor at The Commons, a co-organizer of Startup Milwaukee Emerge, and a member of the Golden Angels Advisors. In addition to her professional involvement, Jackie is an adoptive foster mama and a future pilot. Welcome to the show, Jackie. Thank you for having me. I appreciate I, it. This this has really like come full circle for me. Yeah, it is. crazy. So you were the person, um, we met each other, I don't know, we were just talking a little bit of the show about nine, 10 years ago. And me and my wife were starting a wine shop and you had just, I guess, started doing social media consultant work. Um, and we had crossed paths. I think the company was called... Um, Elance at the time, now it's Upwork. I think that's probably what it was. And yep. you were doing some social media consulting on it. And I always refer back to you as an inspiration, but a lot of times I don't actually call you out by name, but I just say there's a few people that have been in my life that like said, hey, you know, if you do these things like consistently over time, you're going to grow and have a big platform and be able to, you know, develop these opportunities. And along my path, I would get to a point where my personal like comfort of exposing myself maybe as like the the face of the company or the brand of the company would hold me back and I would get a little stressed out and I'd pull back and, and quit doing it. But every time I would do that, I'd say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to what I know. I'm gonna focus on my job. I'm not gonna get all these ideas about, you know, doing crazy entrepreneurship or other stuff. But I'd always have this itch of it kept calling back and coming back and coming back. And I think recently, probably both in the last year, I said, hey, you've let a lot of self-doubt hold you back uh, from doing it. And you feel like, like, I also feel like I had a calling to do something bigger, more impactful, more fulfilling with my life. And I said, you know what? It's because you were trying to uh, shoehorn solutions into the problem that weren't maybe right, but you should have just stuck with it. And if you had stuck with some of the stuff you were doing, like 
you could go places, look at all these other people like Jackie, who has been very successful by sticking to the guns and plans. So I'm super excited to talk to you because you've been like an inspiration along this path. And it's been cool to like watch you go from basically day one almost to where you're at now, which is just this huge social media presence, this amazing marketing agency. So very excited to chat more about that. <laughs> Me too. I think you were one of my very first clients. So it's, it's kind of crazy that we have somehow kept in touch through all of this and now are in very different places and still connected. So I appreciate the conversation. Yeah. So I'd like to start off the question with um, the show with a question. What is your thoughts about luck and are people lucky? It's funny. I mean, I really, I can see both sides. I think that in one way you make your own luck with the way that you work and how hard you work and decisions you make. But then on the other side, you know, like I look at my life and I've been completely very, very lucky in many ways. Like for example, um, I just bought a, bought a new house and we were competing, my boyfriend and I were competing for the house with a few other offers. So we put in an offer with no contingency which was a very risky move considering both of us owned houses. Um, <laughs> we, we got the house and we were both able to sell our houses within like two days of putting them on the market. That is just, that's just lucky. I mean, that was a very risky move because we knew we really wanted the house and it could have gone wrong in so many ways, but it turned out well for us. You know, so I can't help but look at that situation and think we had very little to do with that outside of maybe putting our houses on the market for a good price at a good time. Um, mm -hmm. So I do believe that there's a mix of luck and hard work that contributes to everyone's success. There, there sure is. There's a lot of stuff that just kind of like everything aligns and it's like a perfect storm and it just works out really good. But there's a lot of it that is creating your own luck and being, you know, observant to the opportunities. Like, you know, you're looking for that house. And if it was, if you weren't out there looking, you wouldn't have seen it. You wouldn't have snatched it up and you wouldn't have had maybe the insight to say, hey, we really want this house. What can we do to make our offer a bit more attractive? And you take in some, some calculated risks. So there's, there's a lot of truth to both of those uh, impacts on, on it. So awesome. So let's talk a little bit about day one and the journey to your at right now. So maybe talk a little bit about what is a Celity so people get an idea of the size of your business, but talk about like maybe your journey of going from um, a freelancer to, to running a successful company. Cause I think a lot of people are scared to step out of their comfort zone, you know, take that first step into entrepreneurship and they don't really see like how they can grow from something that could be turned to, you know, considered a side hustle to a full-time job to actually running a very, very successful business. Yeah, I mean, I started, so Excelity is a marketing agency that works mainly with B2B software companies and some B2B service companies. It really depends on how the company is constructed and how much we think we can help them during the sales process. Uh, and we have a team of 15 now. And it's, it's interesting because when you get started in a role like this and you're, I mean, I really built a company based on my own skills. Um, you know, which is a services business. And so it's easier to get started. Like we've never taken any investment um, or outside funding or anything like that, because at the, at the beginning, you know, just like when I met you, you're selling your own skills. Um, and I really, I started it because I wanted it to be a side hustle. Like I, my son is nine now. I had a baby when I got started and was just like, you know, I don't want to be tied to this nine to five corporate job. I want to have my own thing where I can be flexible. But then I kind of like, you know, as I decided to hire people and build an office and all of that kind of stuff, you know, I, now it's my own thing, but I do have like an obligation to a, a nine to five job kind of now. <laughs> it's very weird. It turned, you know, like I started for flexibility and now I don't have as much of it, but it's, it's something that I built myself. So I like mm -hmm. it more. You feel like it's a bit more in control of your destiny. Right. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So, so you work with a lot of startups and a lot of people might say that's a, that's a risky area to service because startups, you know, tend to have a higher chance of not succeeding. They also have a higher chance of not having capital or money to, to go into there. They're, they're usually bootstrapping it or limited resources that they can spend. Why did you decide that startups and specifically software as a service startups was where you wanted to uh, be, be your core business? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, working with startups started as more of a passion project for me because I started my professional career at GE, where there are layers upon layers upon layers of people standing in the way of getting anything done. And that's a very pessimistic <laughs> way of saying it. But, you know, like anytime we, I worked in marketing and sales support. And so if we're putting out a few million dollar contract, it had to be reviewed by this person, then this person, then this person. And it took a month to get out. And I was like, wow, there's a lot of red tape here. Um, and then when I started freelancing and I just kind of fell into working with smaller companies, I was like, oh, wow, I get to work directly with the people that are making the choices and we get to move fast. And that's something that I really like doing. I like the challenge of like the really fast pace and getting to see the impact of your actions pretty quickly. So that's what led me there. It is risky. I mean, we we just had a client last week that is bleeding money and they're going under. I'm, I'm actually shocked that they held on to our contract as long as they did because they had laid off like half of their team by the time they terminated their contract with us. And so it's like, you have to assume that there's a certain amount of risk with it and you have to make sure that you're building enough on the other end to make up for that. Yeah, for sure. And I like that you talked about like, you're you're working directly with the owners or directly with the decision makers. And you're right, like if you go work for like a large firm, they might throw a bunch of money at, um, their marketing efforts, but you may you may not have a lot of influence in the way things go, and there might not be a direct correlation to the efforts you're putting out and the efforts of growing the business. Like if it's like GE, there's very strict guidelines of what the logo can look like, the way it's presented. The you know, so it's just like, hey, we just want you to follow the script, dump it out, and you go, okay, well, we're going to follow the same. But with somebody small that says, hey you know, we only have so much of a budget, but we need some very, you know, accelerated growth in these areas. How can we um, get creative and send this message to a way that has a direct impact and you're seeing like your results. So like for me, I love chatting with startup businesses and, and advising them because I'll be like, oh, you guys are here. You kind of push them in this direction with maybe an introduction to somebody else or an ID or a better way to go about their sales process. And you can see a direct impact of what you've done for them and watch them go from like a little company to a big company. And that's pretty exciting, especially if you've been on that journey yourself. You probably have a lot of stories of people that have helped you along the way that kind of mentored you or advocated for you that just kind of like, hey, this was a big impact moment in my life. And I want to have that same impact on, on the businesses I work with. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, a lot of people at the beginning say you're going to fail too. And I always hear that and I'm like challenge accepted. So (laughs) when they, when they say a lot of people said, don't name your company Excelity, no one's going to know how to pronounce it. And I was like, well, I already made the decision. So we're going to move it forward and don't work with startups because they don't have any money. You'll never get to a million dollar company working with startups. And I was like, we'll see about that. You know, like, and we work with a mix of funded startups, bootstrap startups, some that are scaling up that are entering like a series A or a series B or that aren't even raising at all that are a little bit more mature, but they're still in that smaller range. So I think a good healthy mix helps, you know, helps us with cash flow and keep it predictable and all that good stuff. For sure. So you're also involved with, um, pretty involved in LinkedIn and LinkedIn Mm -hmm. has changed a lot. Like when, I first got on LinkedIn. That's probably why we got connected super early is because like LinkedIn was kind of coming out around 2008 to 2010 and you just got on and made a business profile. Maybe you just, you just did a resume and you didn't do much with it. Maybe a recruiter would contact you, but now LinkedIn is becoming a lot more active. Like I say, it's kind of like Facebook without like all the politicalness and a bit like Twitter without the shit show. Um, (laughs) So it's been a lot of fun and you're, and you're very engaged on it. Like what's been your experience in the change with LinkedIn and how do you use that to, um, promote your business, your personal brand, but also what you recommend to the companies you work with to, you know, get exposure. Yeah. So I started early in my career, I was a recruiter as well. And so I knew of LinkedIn many, many years ago when it was really like the job seeking platform and it wasn't really what it was today. And I didn't start using it the way that I do today until just a few years ago, um, which is just building more of like a business persona. Um, The clients that we work with, the ones that are successful on LinkedIn have to be okay with getting themselves or putting themselves out there. 
And some of our clients, even in the sales process, they'll say like, oh yeah, we have our CEO. He already has X amount of connections or this audience and we're going to help build that up. Um, but then when the rubber hits the road, they're not as comfortable doing it. And we kind of have to find a different, a different avenue. So, mm -hmm. I mean, just like you talked about, I think you and I were talking about before, you really have to be comfortable putting yourself out there and being the face because ultimately people want to work with and sell to people, uh, not just, you know, like business to business to business is not like an actual company selling to a company. It's actually people interacting, making those decisions. It, it really is. It's like, you know, the people that are making buying decisions have to have relationships with the selling and they're not impulse buys. They're usually like, hey, you got to develop a relationship. You're going to have multiple meetings. You're going to have a, a, I guess, a, what would you call it? Um, investigation period. That's not the word I wanted to use, but I can't think of it right now. But <laughs> but basically you're 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 going through this process of courting each other and seeing if it's going to be a, a, the right decision and then you go to work and so it really isn't somebody's just shooting you brand stuff over you're like i don't care i need somebody on the other end that, that if i pick up the phone they're going to answer if there's a problem they're going to work to solve it we know not everything goes right but at least we know who we're talking to and what they're going to do and a lot of times those relationships transfer like if, if a really great uh salesperson leaves one company and goes to another they usually take the book of business with them because you're buying from that person Person, not necessarily that business. And if they're going to a competitor, usually that competitor, I, in my experiences being on the buyer side, is usually considered equal. Like maybe like the, the, there's a differentiation of minor, um, I guess, uh, traits or, or, or features in the product. But for the most part, anybody that we're going to use, like if we're building apartments, we're using one brand of appliances to another. We're not going to use just junk, they're going to be at an equivalent scale. But if my salesperson goes to the competitor, I'm going to say, hey, you know, I know that he's going to handle my account really well. I'd rather stick with what I know than really with what the product is because it's, in all the sense of purpose, is just a, uh, a commodity. So were yeah. you always um, comfortable being in the camera and being the face of your company? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I didn't, I mean, I really didn't want to do it. I always was of the of the opinion that a company's work should speak for itself. And I think that largely ours does. I don't think, I mean, because when people sign on to work with the company, they're not working with me anymore. Um, you know, five years ago, they were working more with me, but now I'm touching base with them once in a while and they have a team of people that are on my team working with them. So it, having the persona out there is good for brand recognition and good for, like generating those leads, but they're not working specifically with me anymore. So mm. uh, it, it, it's interesting. So I couldn't always justify the, you know, like putting myself out there on camera. And also, God, you just open yourself up to so much. Like I put up a post earlier this week and I, I went through about half the comments and then I was just yesterday opened it up and there were a sea of comments that I just really didn't want to deal with. I was like, man, these people are, some of them are just condescending or a little sexist or whatever, you know, like you can do that because you're a woman. And I was like, ah, you know, and <laughs> when, when you put yourself out there in, I don't want to say in the public eye, it's not like, you know, I have 50,000 followers on LinkedIn. It's not a huge audience, but it is enough that you do have to deal with some of the mm -hmm. backlash or hate or whatever it may be. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, I guess I didn't see it as much in the past with LinkedIn, like Facebook, it was always there. And Twitter has always been very, um, people, you know, with, with demeaning comments and, and inappropriate private messages. And, and the more I'm starting to be on LinkedIn, I'm seeing a lot more people post and expose it like, hey, it's not appropriate to talk this way to people. This is a professional platform. It's not a dating site. It's not a place to uh, express your your you know opinion in a negative way. Uh, approach to it um, so it's kind of it's kind of a crazy spot and you're right like you do have to have a bit of a, a thick skin and realize you know nobody you know these people are kind of trying to beat up on you um, but you know it, it does help to put yourself out there and you know bring some people because like you said people want to work with you because they know you and maybe they're not working directly with you but they they have like 
like when you see you out there posting the videos, you, you, you develop a little bit of relatable, you you become a little bit more relatable to me. And I'm like, okay, I kind of get you like your, your personality seems like something I'd, I'd, I'd mesh well with your ideas about doing things are familiar. Like, I feel like there's some trust in you. And even though I'm not working directly with you, like, I feel like you could handle and get the stuff taken care of if we had a problem working with your team. And, and that still transfers over to a lot of business and, and marketing and showing who the company is. Do yeah, you, do you um, encourage your staff to also have a public persona and, you know, do what you're doing and how do they kind of take, take it when you ask them to do that? And what is the example you've set for them? Good question. Um, so I, I think it was last year, maybe the beginning of 2019, I asked my entire team to post at least six pieces of content on LinkedIn in a quarter. So every other week, nothing crazy, but I kind of challenged them all to get out there and it didn't have to be videos. You know, like I was putting my face on video, but they could do anything that really made sense to them. So if they wanted to put things out in written form or some of our designers put out some really interesting content and it didn't have to be about the company, but about their knowledge, because I believe that when they build themselves up as experts in all the different things that they do, like copywriting, marketing strategy, sales, design, that that all, whether they're talking about the company or not, that all reflects back on the company and what we know. So my team actually spends a good amount of time individually putting out content on LinkedIn. Um, and it just, it helps so much during the sales process when we are pursuing an opportunity and we have you know, a handful of people on the team that are connected with this person. So not only is the person talking to our salesperson, they're also seeing my content. They're also seeing content from the people on my team that they would work with. And it mm -hmm. just becomes, you know, it really like amplifies that trust and the understanding that we are knowledgeable, we know what we're doing and all that stuff. So a lot of companies I think would um, not want their employees to do it. You know, like don't build your personal brand on my time and then you're gonna leave with it. Um, that's just not the way that we think about it. I, I love that approach because I'm a big advocate of the more value you can bring to yourself, the more value you're going to be to your employer. And if your employer doesn't recognize that value, it, it's not wasted effort because you can go somewhere else and take that value. But you, I, I can tell that you're a person that values your team investing in themselves and it returns back to the company. Um, so I had two, two, two questions. One, um, was how do you manage that that what the content your staff is putting out is still on brand on point for you do you do you like get into the weeds and micromanage like hey you shouldn't have posted that because you know it's not appropriate for what the image we want to do or do you just kind of let a let it let them figure it out on their own there is no censorship of their content. So, I mean, I have a team of people that I trust and yeah, I, I don't think I've ever asked anyone to take anything down or anything like that. And every platform is different. I mean, they like oh, some of them, especially lately have gotten very political or have a lot of commentary on like Instagram and whatever else it may be. And it's just, in my opinion, it's not up to me to monitor their speech on those platforms. Um, everyone does a really good job on LinkedIn of keeping it very professional. And a lot of them have side hustles. Like a lot of them, um, one of our designers freelances with her own design company on the side, um, doing more like branding and just the kind of work that we wouldn't do. Uh, another one of our designers is a photographer on the side and they talk about that stuff too. And I just, I don't know, I guess I just have never <laughs> had a problem with it. No problems with the freelance. You, you came up through the freelancer where you're not worried that they're going to start the the competing company? I'm not. I mean, gosh, if they want to, they have every, anyone on the team has every opportunity to do so, you know, and I can't stop them even if I wanted to. So, yeah, I like that approach. I think, I think that gives people that uh, a sense of, of belonging that they can pursue their own projects, that they don't feel like they're being held back. They can't, you know, and, and sometimes people outgrow their current role and you say, hey, this is as far as I can go and I need to explore wh what my passions are and leave. And I think that that sets people up to not like sneak around or steal clients, but just it's an open communication of what you're up to. The other thing I wanted to talk about was um, 
when when your staff presents themselves out there on on like LinkedIn and they show themselves uh, as the face of the company too, I think it adds a bunch of value to to the client because when you say, "Hey, you're going to work with my graphic designer," you're going to see like, "Oh, this person, I've seen their their the way they act, the, what the work that they do. I've already kind of got." got to know them and you go, hey, this is really exciting me to work with this team. So even though I'm not working directly with Jackie, I'm really excited to work with this account manager, or this graphic designer, or this copywriter. And so I think it, it does lead a lot of credence to like the company as a whole because you're like, look at all these tools I got. Look at all these amazing solutions we can solve your problems with. Um, and it's, it's really put out there and it gives the face of the company a lot more personality. Mm -hmm. As part of our company sales strategy, we have a, an actual spreadsheet of the opportunities that our sales team is pursuing. And we ask all of our team to go out and connect with these people and have conversations with them. I get messages on LinkedIn and they're like, how am I connected to 10 people on your team? And I'm like, hmm, uh, it's purposeful. Uh, thanks for <laughs> accepting, you know, thanks for accepting the connections, but they kind of, it's, it's interesting because they often are reverse engineering like, oh, that's Smart. We should be doing that for ourselves, and it doesn't hurt by any means to have you know any prospective client connected to five, ten, fifteen people on our team. I do, I do like that idea. It's like, hey, we're the we're you know we're a family. Here we are. Get to know us. You know, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a great approach to it. So, my next question for you is, what does the words "all in" mean to you around an idea or an outcome? Man, I mean, I think that when I look at going all in, I have gone really all in on this business. And that's just being there for the ups, the downs, the good, the bad, and being committed to work through it. Like I'm all in on my team, um, making sure that they have what they need and making sure that they're successful in their roles. I think that if you don't go all in, like go all the way until you have either deemed something successful or you know for sure that it's a failure, um, I think you do yourself a disservice. Yeah, for sure. You do have to put in all those efforts into it uh, to make sure that you're able to be successful. Um, so we talked a bit about the software um, as a service startups or some of the, the clients you work with. Who are some of your ideal clients? And by that, I mean, who are those people that just really gel well with you, you gel well with them, and together it just doesn't even feel like work. It just is an excitement. Like, who are those contacts you're trying to get uh, to work with? Yeah, most of our clients are the ones that we're most successful with are those that are fundraising or funded and they're in older industries. So a lot of them are selling into like banking and finance, healthcare, insurance, construction. It's a lot of industries that have been around for a long time that are kind of ripe for change. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. like, like I said, I started at G and I saw that some hospitals at that time, 10 years ago, were still doing paper charting which is crazy to me, you know? And so they were ready to be disrupted and to digitize everything. Um, that's kind of the arena that we're working in. And then we look a lot at mindset and attitude kind of during the sales process. Like if someone is talking down to our sales team or treating us poorly, we won't sign them because I think that's an indication of what it's going to be like to work together. And we want to work with people where we can get along and where it's not, you know, like a relationship where we're constantly arguing. And I think a lot of vendors and companies get into this like, you know, like fighting relationship. And I just, mm -hmm. I don't have the headspace for that. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you've, you've matured, you know, a lot from, from your days of, of just starting out to where you're at now. And you've probably learned a lot of skills from being like a doer of things to a manager and a leader. And it's, it's mm -hmm. definitely been impressive. And where did you start like realizing that it was important to be more selective with the people you worked with? Probably like, two or three years ago. So it was a few years into the journey because when you get started, you're like, ah, I need money. And all money seems like good money. And you, when you get an opportunity, you take it. Um, but I have found by making this mistake over and over again, that when you take money from people that you know are going to be a pain to work with, or they don't necessarily fit your process, or you're not going to be successful in working with them, you end up losing money, time, employees we've lost employees over bad deals too it's just never mm -hmm. worth it but it, i mean god i had to learn that lesson like 30 times before it's <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a tough one to do and and you go especially if they're big contracts that you haven't had before and you say hey look this is going to be the one that gets us over into the next level and it's just 
a disaster because the client is terrible to work with and you go oh my god this is you know it's 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 you know maybe you know 1% of your client is this one person that's bad and you have 99% are just awesome to work with but that 1% just makes like coming to work the worst and it can actually ruin a lot of morale in the business even though it's not that big of of the overall scope and and it's it's one of the worst feelings so definitely need to select your customers appropriately make sure they're the right fit awesome so somebody wants to get connected to you um, where should they go to find you LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the spot. I am. So on pretty much all the social channels, I am the, the Jackie Hermes because Jackie Hermes was taken. So LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, you can find me really on any platform, Twitter. Too. Awesome. So all those links will be in the show notes. Um, be sure to go over, connect with Jackie, say hi, tell her where you found her and, uh, you know, pay attention to what she's posting. She's putting out a lot of great content that shows you one, how to be a great business leader to how to manage employees, how to excel in, in LinkedIn and just watching her strategy just will show you like, Hey, you know, you don't have to follow it word for word, but if you kind of fit a, figure out a routine that works for you. You can kind of shift the strategy to, to fit you and stand out and start growing your business and start being the face of your company. So, so excited that you're able to come on the show and uh, have a little conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Make sure to visit our website, therealnatepayo.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of All In. While you're at it, if you found value, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if simply tell two friends about the show. Looking to connect? You can find Nate Payo on LinkedIn or Instagram.